Yesterday, we talked about the misconceptions of generating aspirations among Buddhist practitioners. In Chapter 2, we discussed regressing to samsaric minds after generating aspirations. It means that in the beginning, we may believe that we have generated bodhicitta. Unfortunately, somehow, most people deviate from their initial aspirations while carrying out their mission. Especially as their mission reaches a certain scale, they may even want it to keep expanding, just like how a worldly person would think. They forget the attitude that a practitioner should have when working. As a result, all their samsaric minds arise again. All their samsaric minds arise again. This is terrible. If a person who hasn't made stable progress in their practice leaves the Dharma Center, all their samsaric minds will resurface. I believe many of you have experienced it. When you spend six months or a year in the mundane world, all your samsaric minds will arise. We cannot propagate the Dharma with samsaric minds. Those who engage in Dharma activities with samsaric minds are actually supporting the Dharma. If they want to do so, we cannot stop them. We cannot immediately tell them, you must generate bodhicitta before working for the benefit of sentient beings. Without generating bodhicitta, you cannot do such work. We cannot say that. Why? Because those who practice the human and heavenly vehicle are accumulating merits in this vehicle, so they can only do so. We cannot stop them and ask them to first cultivate bodhicitta, as that's impossible. They are not ready to cultivate bodhicitta yet, so just let them do virtuous work with samsaric minds. They support the three jewels with their income and to accumulate merits in the human and heavenly vehicle. They are still in the human and heavenly vehicle, so they cannot be called bodhisattvas. We are currently learning to generate bodhicitta, which is different. If you do virtuous work with samsaric minds, I will also rejoice in you, because those who practice the human and heavenly vehicle are also disciples of the Buddha. They engage in the ten virtuous actions, support the Dharma, and support the three jewels. So, we also rejoice in them. However, we should think about how we should work for the benefit of sentient beings, especially if you have already become a monastic but are still doing everything with samsaric minds, then you are in trouble. Similarly, for lay practitioners who have taken the Bodhisattva vows, before you have cultivated a qualified bodhicitta, you shouldn't engage in dharma activities. You need to first understand bodhicitta and then gradually learn how to work for the benefit of sentient beings. The bigger the mission, the more troubles it may bring in the end. As your mission expands, you may forget your initial aspirations and become like a secular person. You may become arrogant, believing that you are already a great bodhisattva. If others praise you as a great bodhisattva, you may believe that you are indeed a great bodhisattva. If others flatter you, you may even think that you are crowned by the emperor. However, this is not something that can deceive others. You need to be aware of your current spiritual level. We shouldn't indulge in worldly activities. 
If you indulge in worldly activities, you are just a worldly person. We are here to practice the Bodhisattva path, not to indulge in worldly activities. Many of you have taken the Bodhisattva vows. You should first cultivate Bodhicitta well and then gradually do what you can for the benefit of sentient beings. This is different from the way of worldly people. Isn't this taught in the sutras? The Buddha taught this exactly. You are all intelligent, so why do you act in such a silly way? Even if you were to offer all the wealth in the world to all practitioners, you would only receive the karmic rewards of the human and heavenly realms. However, if we generate Buddha and then give a handful of food to a dog, the merit would far surpass the above. They cannot be compared. Therefore, those who have taken the Bodhisattva vows must earnestly cultivate Bodhicitta. Only after you have truly generated Bodhicitta can you work for the benefit of sentient beings. Otherwise, don't do it. If you do, you are silly because it is futile. In fact, the root cause for regressing into samsaric minds after generating aspirations is that one hasn't cultivated a qualified renunciation, which is the determination to get rid of samsara. As a result, while working for the benefit of sentient beings, all samsaric minds resurface. In this case, why do you engage in such work? It would be a waste of time. In the age of Dharma decline, practitioners are very prone to going astray. In yesterday's evening class, I explained it clearly. From the mind of ordinary beings, the formation of the samsaric mind, to how to cultivate a good state of mind, and then into the misconceptions of generating aspirations among Buddhist practitioners, generating aspirations due to some kind of attachment. For example, some people find monasteries tranquil and therefore generate aspirations due to the attachment to tranquility. Some people generate aspirations due to the attachment to merits, such as the merits of building temples and making offerings to the three jewels. Some others are attached to spiritual attainments. They engage in dharma activities and support the three jewels due to some kind of attachment. We need to carefully examine this. We all have this problem, just to a greater or lesser extent. We need to be cautious and carefully examine ourselves, just like customs officers inspecting goods. You should strictly examine your aspirations. Is your aspiration mixed with attachments? Do you have various samsaric thoughts? You should examine it clearly before working for the benefit of sentient beings. If you are not clear about your aspiration, then no matter what teaching you practice, it will be useless. Even if you claim to practice various advanced teachings, you are just boasting and it's useless. You should be aware of your own status. If you have truly generated Bodhicitta, the Devas and Nagas will naturally support you. I promise that if you have truly generated Bodhicitta, the Devas and Nagas will push you to engage in Dharma activities. Even if you don't want to, you have to do so. The Dharma protectors will naturally push you to start your mission. Therefore, don't rush to engage in Dharma activities. 
Many great masters in the past only started propagating the Dharma late in their lives. Why? Because prior to that, the conditions were not ripe. They followed the causes and conditions without clinging to them. You should diligently engage in spiritual practice, read the sutras that you should read, practice the teachings that you should practice, and do what you should do every day. As long as you are a monastic today, you should do what you are supposed to do today. Some of you, despite having become monastics, don't do what you are supposed to do, but instead spend your days aimlessly. What are you doing? You might serve as construction workers or bosses. In the Buddhist community, we don't need bosses. Shakyamuni Buddha is our leader. We are all equal. We are here to practice, not to be bosses. Don't forget your initial aspiration. We are here to liberate ourselves from samsara. If you don't seek liberation from samsara, then why do you come to the Buddhist path? Chapter 7 Characteristics of Buddhacitta Awakening The practice of Buddhacitta must be rooted in awakening. One should constantly be mindful and perceive the five desires and the six sense objects as illusory. One should be mindful of the various manifestations of the samsaric mind, such as greed, anger and ignorance, without being influenced by them. The first characteristic of Buddhacitta is awakening, which refers to having the wisdom of emptiness. Being mindful of the various manifestations of the samsaric mind without being influenced by them refers to awakening. Not following deluded thoughts. Not being influenced by the samsaric mind. This requires you to see through the world, to realize that the five desires and six sense objects are illusory, and then you can gradually free yourself from the samsaric mind. The characteristic of the samsaric mind is the lack of awakening, also known as ignorance. Ignorance leads to the attachments to self in person and self in phenomena, as well as the three poisons of greed, anger and delusion. Spiritual practice is actually quite simple. It is just about eliminating ignorance. After ignorance is eliminated, the related karma and afflictions will gradually cease. When learning the Buddha's teachings, we need to be clear about our purpose. We are here to eliminate ignorance and attachment, not to pursue worldly achievements. As Buddhist practitioners, we shouldn't pursue worldly achievements. For instance, if you think, I want to become a great master, build a grand temple, and guide sentient beings. You might be pursuing worldly achievements. It may sound like guiding sentient beings, but is this your real intention? I guess you want to be in a position of power? We are here to seek liberation, not to seek a position of power. We should pursue liberation. Amitabha Buddha has planted many lotus flowers in the Pure Land, waiting for you to go there. We should go there instead of staying in the mundane world where there is a risk of engaging in negative activities. It's safer to go to the Pure Land. Some great Buddhasattvas say they will not go to the Pure Land, and we certainly rejoice in them. If you have that certainty, that's great. 
Or, if you go to the Western Pure Land, sign up, catch a glimpse of Amitabha Buddha, and then return. That's also fine. After you see Amitabha Buddha, you will be different. Anyway, I encourage you to go to the Pure Land. Of course, some people have already attained enlightenment, so it doesn't matter if they go to the Pure Land or not. If you have truly attained enlightenment, then you don't need to go there and waste the cost of the trip, as it takes time to go there and then come back. Even if the ticket is free, the round trip still takes time. If you have that much time, you can guide more people to the Pure Land. You can see Amitabha Buddha right here, without bothering to go to the Pure Land. You can directly see Amitabha Buddha in the here and now. It's not that difficult. You should practice diligently. If you really have faith, you can see Amitabha Buddha. You don't need to wait until after death to see Amitabha Buddha, because by then it may be too late. You can first meet Amitabha Buddha, confirm your admission with him, which means knowing when you will be reborn there in advance, book your lotus, and then go there. Otherwise, if you are not sure about your admission status and don't know where you will go after death, you will be in trouble. Therefore, we should prioritize our liberation from samsara and not engage in useless activities. Even if you were to build ten temples, it would be useless. What is the point of building ten temples? In your next life, you might become a guardian in the temple, guarding it for thousands of years, while others have already attained enlightenment in the pure land. Therefore, we should eliminate this habit to some extent. Being a Dharma protector is good. Lay people often start by praying to the Buddha, and after making money, they will feel grateful and support Dharma activities. In this process, they may develop the habit of being a Dharma protector. If they don't support Dharma activities, they will feel uncomfortable. It's good to support Dharma activities, but we should cultivate Buddhacitta. We should be Dharma protectors who have attained enlightenment and developed great wisdom, protecting all sentient beings. Such Dharma protectors are different and advanced. Selflessness and Altruism if one can thoroughly see the illusory nature of self, the gap between oneself and others will disappear. Only by realizing a non-self can we truly benefit others, and the practice of benefiting others can also continuously eliminate the attachment to self. The practice of benefiting others can eliminate the attachment to self. Although you may understand the principles of non-self, the habit of self-attachment is still deeply ingrained. By continuously benefiting others, the habit of self-attachment will gradually diminish and the wisdom of non-self will be constant. By benefiting others, we can eliminate the habit of self-attachment. However, we need to first thoroughly see the truth of non-self and the illusory nature of self. This requires wisdom. Boundlessness In the ten great vows of the aspiration prayer of Samantha Bhadra, whether it is paying homage to the Buddhas or benefiting sentient beings, each vow encompasses all the Buddhas throughout the ten directions of the universe in the past, present and future, as well as all sentient beings in the entire universe. 
This fully illustrates the vastness and boundlessness of Buddhacitta. Buddhacitta is boundless. Equanimity The compassion of Buddhasattvas is unconditional and universal. There are no conditions nor differences between oneself and others, likes and dislikes, closeness and distance. Such compassion is based on the equality of oneself and others. This is not easy. It may be easy to talk about cultivating equanimity, but it is difficult to put it into practice. Awakening, selflessness, altruism, boundlessness and equanimity are all characteristics of Buddhacitta. Just reading these characteristics makes us feel ashamed. In terms of cultivating Buddhacitta, we all fall short and have a long way to go. Freedom from the attachments to forms and attainments. Buddhacitta should be free from attachment to all forms. When generating the Supreme Buddhacitta, there is no attachment to forms. While practicing the Buddhasattva path, we should also refrain from attachments, nor should we cling to the notion of attainment. Otherwise, our practice would be no different from the human and heavenly vehicle. Cultivating Buddhacitta requires wisdom, selflessness, altruism, not seeking rewards and being free from attachments or the notion of attainment. Otherwise, it would be the practice of the human and heavenly vehicle, which is another story. We often talk about this. We should differentiate between the practice of Buddhacitta and the practice of the ten virtuous actions. 